Okay. Welcome back, everyone. For those of you that were not in this room in the prior session, my name is Bernie Mongilio. I'm the uh, Vice President for the Pittsburgh Market for CGI. Um, CGI is a large IT services company headquartered in Montreal, Canada. Uh, we're very active in the big data space, which is part of the reason that we're here today and proud, happy and proud to be a sponsor of this event. It's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker, um, uh, John Vu, who's a director um, of uh, Master's of Science program um, in Biotechnology, Innovation, and Computation, um, and, and um, director at the Boeing CMU Aerospace Data Analytics Lab. He'll be talking to us about big data in the aerospace industry. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Let me, before let me start, let me ask you the questions. How many of you have uh, experienced an airplane delay in your life? <laughs> Is that 20 minutes? 30 minutes? Right? Keep going, keep going. 60 minutes? Half of a day? Yeah. Right, so this is an issue that we've seen all the time. Let me see, how do this one? Okay, for the airline to make money, airplane must fly. You all, we know that. If you can look into this for 20 minutes, that's a few thousands. For a couple hours, we're talking about 20, 30 thousands. And for more than an hour, we're talking about six figures right there. So basically, the major problem today with every airline is how to keep the airplane flying. And there's a lot of problems with, with airplane today because as you probably understand that, the airplane maintenance repair overhaul must be as efficient as possible. And right now, it is not. And uh, we are trying to, uh, to fix it. How do I? Whoops. So very few people understand that aerospace is very data intensive. Uh, when I mentioned that to my student and mentioned to my colleague, many people say, I don't believe it. I believe that probably healthcare and probably have more. But I think that right now, all the data we collect is just about the tip of the iceberg. And very, very few people really understand the order of magnitude happened in the aerospace. And let me share with you some, some data. So today, Facebook, they claim that they have 800 terabytes of data per day. And that's a phenomenon. Well, 787 has, are we using work thousand, but it's really hundred thousands of sensor. And basically, a 787 generates about one terabyte of data per hour. And so today, take a fleet of 100 uh, 787s. You're talking about 1,600 terabytes per day. And right now, there's a 300 of them are flying, and there's about 3,000 of them on order. This is one airplane, 787. So you can see that the order of magnitude of this one airplane. So this is just 787. Whoops. So basically, from a big data, it's really nothing new. We have been collecting data for many, many years. Mostly, we have sensor for altitude, for speed, for stability during flight. The aeroplane and industry has been collecting data for many, many years, mostly for safety. So if you look at the fleet of airplane today, of 737, 747, 6777, 7, 7, 787, we're talking about exabyte and zettabyte and could be yodabyte per hour, not per day. Think about that. And this is something that when I show the data, people don't believe in it. And oh, by the way, I was a chief engineer of 777 before I retired and came back to CMU. So I'm very familiar with this data. So we've been collecting data. We've been doing this one for many, many years. And you can see that today, uh, this is a tremendous amount of data. And company, and in the airplane, you have many components. So again, jet engine people collecting the data. Uh, manufacturing people collected it. Now within the airplane, there's a lot of computer system and different systems. All of the system have their own data. And all these data has been collected and stored for many, many years but rarely been mining, 
rarely been used. The business intelligence people, statistics people collecting data mostly for historical data. But when big data come in, we're talking about predicting data. So instead of say, you all have a car, you all receive uh, some manufacturing, say 5,000 miles, you have to change oil. Uh, 10,000 miles, you have to change spark plug. Everybody know that. And nobody have asked a question, why 5,000 miles? Why 10,000 miles? Well, because that was a guesswork based on some historical data and based on some of the design engineer. That's what they predict. That's what they think. But when you take the, a car to service, you have thousands of people, different people driving car, uh, different mechanic to fixing car, the result come up is very, very different. Some people could say, I can drive the car for 20,000 miles without changing oil and everything is fine. Right? So the, again, the same thing happened to airplane. When you take the airplane and take to the maintenance, the maintenance say during that time for the number of hours, this is what you have to do. But the mechanic coming in, they fix exactly like that, and then the airplane flying, and then something broken, and you have to ground the airplane. Well, the mechanic says, it has nothing to do with me. That's the other part. So right now, we need to have a way of predicting to see when you have an airplane coming in for overhaul or for some repair or maintenance, besides follow the procedure that was designed by the FAA and designed by the engineer, there are data that are available. So when you bring in the airplane, you're fixing 20 things. Maybe you want to fix another 10 things because that's a possibility for broken. And this is a new way of maintaining the airplane. So by collecting all these data, by or have all of these data available, all these companies now, there's Boeing, Airbus, Bombardier, they can really adjusting and make additional money. And this is really about something that is, we are just beginning to see something happening in the industry. Uh, today, with predicting analytic and complex machine learning, there's a lot of potential I've seen in the airplane maintenance. In the old day, uh, when, uh, when the airplane uh, reaching a destination, the crew coming in, hook up a uh, analytic device into the airplane, look into a computer to say, okay, these are the things we need to place, we need to replace because something broken there. Well, if the part is not available in that airport, then immediately you have to go out and say, who has a next a part like that? Uh, if we are in Pittsburgh with a part in Chicago, we had to ground the airplane there and we had to send uh, another next destination airplane from Chicago to go to Pittsburgh to bring in the part. So right now, the key thing here, if we can predict, and if we know the destination, and today during flight, we have the capability of running a diagnostic analytic right away on inside the airplane and send a signal to the, um, des the next destination. So when the airplane arrives in destination, we know exactly what to do, and immediately at that time, we have to bring in the part for, if it's not located in the sampling, when the airplane is in flight, we know exactly what they need, and we know exactly what part is located. If the next destination do not have a part, then we have to find the way of flying the part coming in. So the key thing is fixing the airplane at the right place, at the right time, with the right part. And if we can do that, then we don't have to worry about airplane grounded. And this is a new way of looking at airplane maintenance rather than based on historical data that we did in the past. And that we running some tests at uh, our university, and the ally come back said, uh, if you can do that, it's multi-billion dollar business. So the idea in here is we want to, using big data analytics, to really increase the accuracies, the quality, and streamline the workflow. Again, today, airplane, airline has all kind of uh, issue. They have to make sure that they have the right crew at the right place, at the right destination. Because not all pilots are training on airplane. So you have to, and then you have experienced pilot, you have inexperienced pilot, you have someone familiar with this type of airplane. So having the crew management is also a, is a major issue for airline. And having the right place and the right crew at the right airplane is also very, very important. In the past, it's a lot of things to do with historical data. It has a lot of things to do with scheduling. What happens if a captain is sick? What happens if you don't have enough crews? What happens if you have airplane delay and the crew cannot make it on time? So there's a lot of variable in that kind of um, uh, uh, crew management. 
So by having a big data, analyze all of these data, we can come up with a much better algorithm to schedule them, and we are working on some of these things, and the airline really love it. And as again, we look at the operation of the airline to fly into different destinations, and we say, if we move in this schedule a little bit, maybe you can fly between San Francisco and Hawaii two times a day. Maybe you can increase in three times. And we test it, and we did. And basically, when you can fly three times, more airplane on the uh, flying, that means more money for the airline. So these are the things, all the potential that are happening in the aerospace industry. So also by collecting data from the jet engine, from all those sensors, remember that the, let me give you a simple example, a turbofan from Pratt & Whitney. A turbofan is not that sophisticated compared to a jet. It has about 5,000 sensors. And they generate about, about a terabyte per flight. So thinking about uh, 3,000 of the turbofan right now flying, and thinking that's a small regional jet, and thinking about a large engine like a GE or Pratt & Whitney, we're talking about several thousand sensors. And so we have all kind of these data being collected, and we was able to adjust some trust level on the um, Pratt & Whitney, and we played with that uh, for about a uh, couple months. And the, airline, and the uh, jet engine people come back and say, John, we save about 5% of fuel. And 5% of fuel is a lot of money. So the, again, the potential in aerospace is huge, very, very big, bigger than a lot of people even today even know. So by doing a lot of analytics efficiently, we can reduce the downtime for the airplane. We can improve the airline efficiency. We can, of course, we, the airline also collecting data from the people who flying, especially uh, you know, uh, business people who flying a lot. So by analyzing these data, we can reduce in, uh, downtime, we can improve efficiency, we can really improve customer satisfaction. So that, again, everybody agree, this is the future of the way airline, airline should operate, the way manufacturing should build and design, and also the way that all of the data should be collected for better maintenance and operational. So that's a, but however, in the airline and in the airspace, that's a big issue. One of the major issues today is you have, the data has an ownership. So the engine people do not want to share the data. Of course, the manufacturing do also do not want to share the data. Within the airplane, there's 100 systems, and all of the systems have a different company, and they all have data, but they don't share. So how do you collaborate? How do you make all of these people working together? This is a one of the major issues. The second issue is everything with the aerospace business is dealing with safety, and it's highly regulated. And again, you have privacy. You have a lot of government policies in there. So that's an other issue with that. And then transferring a huge number of data for collecting all of these sensors down from the airplane into the ground, that's another major issue right now that uh, we need to solve. But today, with the fast speed of internet, with a lot of streaming data, with a lot of sophisticated technology, I think this problem is not too difficult to solve. And we did some of the analytics of that. I do believe that big data holds significant promise for our airspace industry, and we just barely touching the tip of the iceberg. And this is just commercial airplane. Think about military airplane, think about space, think about uh, other things, that's huge. So basically right now, we're working with all of these uh, independent groups. So a few years ago, I start asking all of them, how do we play, how do we collaborate? And the result of all of these dishes with them is everybody agreed to play, but they don't want to share data with each other. Uh, that's one thing, if we create a lab at CMU. So we are neutral, we are university, we are not there to compete with anybody. We want to collect this data. Can you give us the data? Yes, no problems. So right now we are using real data for our training with our real students. So basically this is a, the first establish of the lab. We want to push the, uh, the envelope much more further. So this is one of the things I want to introduce to you, especially in Pittsburgh. Uh, the lab has been, basically right now, it's established. They're signing up with Boeing and a number of aerospace companies just about uh, a month ago, we, even though we have been working on this one for a number of years. 
One of the issues I've seen today is everybody talking about big data, but the major problem is a confusion on the term. We are using the term data scientist. Well, that's a, every job I've seen is data scientist. Data scientists involve a lot of research, a lot of skill. They usually a PhD level. But there are data architects, and there are data analysts, there's a data engineer. And it's not of the company are using it. So my student, when they graduate, say, I can't get a, a data scientist because that's required PhD. And throughout, I did a research on the industry, the same thing. Every company using the same term. So basically, there's a level we call data analyst or data programmer or data engineer. These only need a, a bachelor degree. And then you have a data architect, and, and then you go into a master. Of course, a scientist is usually PhD. So the scientist is doing a lot of analytics and algorithms, but the other one is the programming. So again, just like anything else, that's a lot of confusion that we need to do. And I also did something very special. I ordered my student to do one year of investigation on the job of data science throughout the United States. And the most surprising to me is a, the place for all the data scientists, the job available is Washington, DC, 34% of job posting. New York with 32, San Francisco and San Jose is about 24, Boston seven, Pittsburgh is less than 1%. And we graduate about 300 students in big data analytics, mostly master degrees, 99.9% .9 of them left for some other place. Very few of them stay. So I think that what we need to do is um, we have to do something. And this is one of the data for one year, uh, 2014, uh, that uh, our student collect. And collect from uh, newspaper, collect from all this uh, job.com and everything like that. So they're pretty good data. Of course, they, are, they, know, they can't find unknown data, right? So Pittsburgh, we, we know that we have excellent education in here. We have Pitt, we have CMU, we have a lot of good university. We have the talent in Pittsburgh. We have a lot of industry with a lot of data rich. We have healthcare, we have finance, we have technology, and now we have aerospace. Now we have Google move to Pittsburgh, Uber move to Pittsburgh, Boeing Lab going to be in Pittsburgh. I really believe that we have to do something together, all of us, how to make Pittsburgh to be the city of big data innovation. We need to make Pittsburgh a hub for big data. When I ask a student why you want to go to San Francisco, why not in Pittsburgh? We say, well, there's no job in Pittsburgh. Well, it's not true, but you know, many of the company in Pittsburgh, we don't advertise and we don't recruit the student. And I talk with Ben, I think in order to have the students very well trained students, you need to work with them as early as possible. Don't wait until they graduate and then going out and recruiting them. So this is the first year I coach a student from the, the day the student enter the university, they are working on real project. So they say, you work on this project in GE. Are you committed to work for GE? You work on this project with data from Boeing. Are you committed to work for Boeing? If they are familiar with that, if they work in that kind of project, and this is the first year, instead of going to Google and Facebook, I got 10 students decide to stay and work in our lab. And I really think that from a point of view, with all of you, I think we need to work together with a technology council, with everybody out at university. We need to make Pittsburgh the next destination of all big data. Thank you very much.